So welcome to our last Tiny Tom Talks. This is about hitchhikers and ballistics covering how seeds move. And we're here with our research ecologist, Tom Simpson. I am Jackie Bureau, the stewardship ecologist for McHenry County Conservation District. So Tom, why do plants disperse their seeds? And kind of seems like uh, mature plants would have a good spot to be. So why do they need to send their seeds elsewhere? Well, I think it's, a, it's an important question um, because I think we, we think of plants in terms of the plants that we see, which live for a year, like an annual plant, uh, or a few years or maybe a few centuries. And we sort of imagine uh, that that's the life of plants. It sort of unfolds over that time scale. And in a way it does, but for the plant to have survived to this year, I mean, the plant, the plants evolved for flowering plants about a hundred million years ago. Uh, plants like ferns oh, around 400 million years ago. They had to make it all the way from there to here. And so that's that's the that's the prime directive in in uh, in the life cycle of plants is that they have to survive over huge long periods of time species over tens of thousands of years perhaps or hundreds of thousands of years and so over that period of time glaciers have advanced and retreated over the Chicago area numerous times so anything that just stayed put would be dead would be would be gone and and uh, and absent from uh, from the flora. Today, it had to be able to move south um, as the climate cooled and get out of the way and then move back north again as the climate warmed and the ice got out of the way. If it couldn't do that, then it wouldn't be here. So that, that need for dispersal in the life cycle of plants is an absolute necessity in a Darwinian world. They have to be able um, to move. Uh, and moving is a way of moving your genetic information. I mean, pollen dispersal is actually not quite the same as seed dispersal, but it's a way of moving your genetic information away from where you're growing that might allow some of that genetic information to survive in some place that doesn't have the catastrophe where you're sitting today. So um, dispersal plays a, an absolutely essential role in the life cycle of plants. I have to point out, because I'm a huge nerd, that you said the prime directive, so plants going where no plants have gone before. I like yes. it. I think it works the other way. They stole, all Star right, Trek right. stole that from <laughs> So it, do all plants have seeds or are there other ways that they can reproduce or, or spread their seeds? Yeah, seeds, the seed plant evolved. Well, the first seed plants that, um, evolved that we commonly see around us today are, are conifers, uh, pine trees. Uh, and those are around 350 million years ago. Um, so that's the evolution of the seed and the seed is the little embryo. It's a little embryo of the next generation. And that's encased in usually a little food stored in there and there's a seed coat, protective seed coat around that. Um, and we still have plants like conifers around today, hundreds of species of those all around uh, the world. Um, but there are plants that were around before conifers that are still around today, like ferns and club mosses uh, and horsetails, uh, the true mosses, uh, liverworts. All of these never produce seed. Um, the large plant that you see growing, like, like a fern that you see growing in the woods or on a, on a rock wall, um, only produce spores and the spores are the agent of dispersal. Those can blow very long distances, even, even between continents that they get into the upper upper atmosphere and into the, the jet stream, they can move around the world. Um, so that's the agent of dispersal with something like a fern. It still, it still creates an embryo. It still creates sperm nuclei and egg nuclei and those unite and create another generation of ferns, but, but, in, in the life cycle of the fern is a spore producing generation. That's actually true of flowering plants and conifers and all plants also, as much as I love, to, love those kind of details, I won't go into them now, but that spore producing generation gets hidden 
you, you don't really see it uh, as obviously with uh, with flowering plants and conifers as you do with things like ferns. So you have the seed is a mean of re reproduction and dispersal, uh, but you can have means of dispersal for plants that don't produce seeds. The next generation seeds. The Star Trek references yeah. have to stop. Uh, yeah. So we called this hitchhikers and ballistics. Can you just tell me what that is talking about? What is a hitchhiker seed? What is a ballistics seed? Well, the one is very common and the other is, is quite rare. Um, most people, I think, on this email have had hitchhiker seeds hitchhike on them, so they kind of know what they are. Hitchhiker uh, refers to a group of seeds from a wide variety of uh, of uh, different plant families. I believe all that I'm aware of are flowering plants. I was trying to think of a, an exception to that, but I think they're all flowering plants. Um, and generally on their most likely on the ovary wall somewhere, sometimes an accessory part of the fruit uh, that has a little hook on it that grabs onto your clothing or the hair of a passing mammal or perhaps onto, the, onto a bird and then is carried by that animal long distances. Um, it's actually an extremely efficient long range dispersal mechanism uh, and, uh, and widely used say, by many different plants in many different plant families. Um, use hitchhiker seeds. Ballistics is a, is, a, is a much more limited group because it's a means of relatively short range dispersal. The plant actually shoots its seeds um, a matter of feet. Uh, I can remember collecting my first trees course in the fall of 1981 at the University of Illinois and they had us collect little fruits of trees uh, and that was, that was our semester project. And I collected uh, witch hazel which have these funny little, um, not quite, I think it's, I'm not sure if you call it a capsule, what the name of the fruit is, but anyway, it kind of looks like a dragon's head with a mouth. And as it dries, uh, you get, part of it shrinks and part of it doesn't shrink as much and it develops a tension and then suddenly it opens and it shoots the seeds out. And I can remember sitting in the living room uh, in the kitchen in the apartment was right ne next to it. And I started hearing these these little seeds firing around the kitchen and bouncing off the walls and the floor. And I wondered what's going on. And I went in there and saw that my witch hazel seeds, the fruits that I'd had drying, had opened up and shot the seeds around. Um, another much more common one in McHenry County is the jewel weed or a touch-me-not, the genus impatiens. Uh, See a lot of the spotted touch me not in is an abundant plant in our wetlands that when the seed pod matures uh, as it starts to dry, it develops a tension. And then when you touch it, it just bursts and the seeds will fly a few feet away. It doesn't seem like a terribly efficient means of dispersal to me because they rarely fly more than a few feet. It could be that those seeds have other means of dispersal also once they're out there. A lot There's a lot of seeds when you look at implants and you look at the little seed and it doesn't have wings on it, it doesn't have a burr on it, and it's just sitting there and you wonder, well, how does it get around? And the answer to a lot of that is, is, is insects carry them around. We don't really think of, we think of squirrels carrying acorns, but insects, in particular ants, can carry a lot of seeds around. And so that maybe one of you could take that up as a study. You just follow those, those jewelweed seeds, you know, stake them out and just watch them and see if anyone picks them up and carries them around. So there's two different kinds of explosive de dehiscence, uh, if you want a fancy word for it, or, or the ballistic seeds, uh, short range dispersal, but doesn't need any help to do that. Um, and then the hitchhiker seeds, which are really a, to work through relationships uh, with a type of symbiosis with with animals that, to carry the seeds around, which is very widespread in many plant families. And we all, I was just carrying uh, stick seeds on my coat out of the woods this morning when I was out with phenology volunteers. So I was participating in seed dispersal. Whether you wanted to or not. I seem to recall mm -hmm. in one of my naturalist classes that there was like naturalist hazing. You told somebody to go up to that plant. It was jewel weed. And just tell them, can you go take a look at that? And then they don't know when it's got about to coil and explode at you. It kind of surprises them. Yeah. I've, I've played that trick on students many times, you know. 
I did it most recently with a course I was teaching and I told them about it and then I walked away and I was walking away and I heard this shout of joy and I just thought, oh, that's one of the nicest things that's happened to me today. Um, so it's a, it's, if you haven't played a trick on your friend, uh, just wait for the opportunity. It's a lot of fun. And I know often when we think of seeds, we think of things that we can eat, nuts that squirrels are carrying around, but are there more types of seeds that are not food? Are most of them some kind of food? I imagine since almost all seeds contain some store food, I mean, orchid seeds are sort of a, at least some of the orchid seeds have virtually no food and won't germinate unless they can establish immediately a relationship with a fungus from which they get their nutrition. That plant family excluded, essentially all seeds carry some sort of stored food which would make them obvious targets for predators of one kind or another. Whether those predators can be agents of dispersal is another is another question. Um, so, you know, the the interesting thing about animals eating fruits from the uh, from the, of course from the animal's point of view, you have you have eating like birds eat buckthorn berries and then poop them out later that digestion excretion uh kind of dispersal is very efficient if you if you look at a at a farm field and then start at the edge and start walking in and look at i remember doing this with a class at the morton arboretum many years ago and listening we're just looking at the woody plants because there are fewer of those species that the wind dispersed plants were near the edge and the farther you got to the middle the more it was simply the 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 bird dispersed seeds or, or plants that you found out in the middle because that was several hundred yards away from the edge and seeds just typically don't blow that far at least the seeds we were dealing with there so um so you have that ingestion excretion seed but you also have the uh the gathering and caching behavior of squirrels really uh, many different rodents we fo often focus on squirrels and blue jays and out west, some species of woodpecker, because they're they're actually agents of dispersal for oaks and other nut seeded plants. Uh, really, an uh, unnecessary part of the life cycle of oaks. Uh, they don't blow very far. You know, they fall off the tree and may the stiff wind. They may blow about three feet, but they're not going to blow very far. And yet, oaks retreated to the southeastern United States and came all the way back here with glaciation. So they obviously have efficient means of dispersal. Um, for doing that. So there's that gathering and caching dispersal. And for things, seeds that are eaten, you know, there's this, and from the plant's point of view, there are plants that where they're eating the whole ovary, like a berry or a or a or a palm, like a, like an apple. Uh, there are plants where the the stalk of the the ovule or what becomes the seed swells up and envelops the seed. We call that a uh, um aerolate seed, like um um Asian bittersweet. Those bright orange fruits of Asian bittersweet are eaten by birds. That's not a fruit, that's a seed. And the fleshy covering is actually the stalk of the seed that grows up and envelops the seed and functions the same way. And the other, well, kind of strange one is the juniper, which is a seed plant, it's a conifer. And yet it creates what look like little blue berries. Well, they're not berries at all, they're cones. And if you look really closely at one under a, under a magnifying glass, you can see the cone scales but they're fleshy and they're kind of sweet. I mean, uh, I don't really like to eat them. Uh, I'm not a gin drinker, but that's where gin gets its flavor is from, from in, in small doses, it's a pleasant, it's a pleasant flavor. Um, and so there's a conifer, which is very rare amongst conifers is actually modified its cone to use animals for dispersal. I, I, there are probably other examples of that in the conifers. That's the only one I can think of. Although there are many, many different junipers, all of whom all of which use the same uh, dispersal mechanism. So a part of the animals eating fruits, I mean, sometimes it's just eating the fruit and it doesn't do the plant any good at all, but plants have figured that out and use that extensively as a means of dispersal and it's an extremely efficient means of dispersal. Much to our chagrin when your woods fills up with honeysuckle and buckthorn and autumn olive and, uh, and I can, you know, give you a list of another dozen in bird dispersed plant uh, 
non-native plants that swarm into the woods uh, very quickly. So very efficient means of dispersal. It's interesting how you said the squirrels, you know, they, over time have helped disperse the oaks and I imagine given enough time you can travel across a continent, but how do seeds get from that mainland to say an island that might be hundreds of miles away? Well, that's a, that's, it's funny how, I mean, when you see the ingenious ways that plants do things like a bird that has little hook seeds, you sort of look at that and immediately think of it as a problem that some engineer sat down and thought about, well, what could I do to the fruit of the burdock or, or the cockle burr that would, it's actually a, a rather odd uh, composite family plant, um, that would allow it to grab onto something and then carry it a long distance, but then fall off later on. It's a sort of engineering challenge and it probably an engineer would have to go through two or three iterations before they found something that was just sticky enough to grab on, but not so sticky that it would always stick to the animal, which wouldn't do the plant any good because it's not going to grow on top of the back of a, you know, coyote or, or wolf. Uh, and so with, with colonizing islands, you find that plants have evolved fruits that float. Uh, the coconut you buy in the store is, is the, I believe I got this right, this is this seed i know it's encased in a huge fibrous husk that floats and uh during storms uh those wash out to sea and then float around and eventually uh go under an island i mean seed dispersal in plants you realize that seeds produce thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands with orchids it's millions and millions of seeds for every one of them that will have a chance to grow into a plant of the next generation that's how seeds solve that problem is just by dispersing seeds out in in enormous numbers so uh and the other interesting what way of colonizing islands is the uh um uh well, what is it the uh mangroves the fruit forms on the tree and then the seeds germinate and actually start to grow when they're still on the parent tree and then they go dormant and so you have this long narrow essentially seedling and it drops off and it floats root down, it floats in the water and can float for months. And then if it lodges in the mud, it will break dormancy and start to grow again. So they grow along the shores of islands and other mainlands. Uh, so it's uh, that long range dispersal by floating uh, is essential. You can get so far from other, uh, I think in the Darwin, Tom talked, was it last year or the year before, I talked about Ascension Island and the fact there are only a few dozen species that ever found their way out there, volcanic island, you know, a million years old, and yet there were only a few dozen species that have been able to find their way out there to that island just so far away. And yet there were, there were a few plants that were growing out there. That's so some plants seem to solve almost every problem in dispersal. I only have one or two more questions for you. So this is everybody's reminder if you have questions to put them in the chat and then I will ask them after this. But are there any other crazier types of seed dispersal? I know we mentioned ballistic seeds. Um, in my mind, I'm thinking of bloodroot and uh, the little seed that's on there. Are you talk about any of those other types of seed dispersal? Well, bloodroot is an example of a, of a of seeds that are dispersed by ants, and there are probably many more of those than we than we know about. We know about a few of them. Bloodroot, uh, gonna list here. Um, Dutchman's breeches, squirrel corn, and near relative of blood Dutchman's breeches, bloodroot, trillium, violet, many of the sedge species. Um, they uh, they have a little usually have a little tiny fleshy part. That is attached to the seed that is the actual food the ants are interested in, but the ants will carry the seed and then store it somewhere in order they're storing the food. And in doing that, they're dispersing the seeds. So there's a lot of seed dispersal going on at a sort of microscopic, not microscopic, but below our sort of normal, what we're, we're aware of when we just walk, stumble through the woods on a trail and look at the flowers and the trees and listen to the birds. There's a lot going on under our feet. Uh, that's critical to the life cycle of plants. There's insects dispersing seed. In one case, there's an orchid that actually its fruit pods are eaten by crickets. Uh, 
and the crickets, then it's an ingestion, uh, excretion, dispersal mechanism, just like plants eating buckthorn berries. The crickets then move the seed in and excrete waste in there, and the orchid seed is excreted with it, and perhaps even some of the fungi that uh, that the orchid will need in order to uh, to grow to the next generation. Um, you see, um, oh, tumbleweed, we've all seen that in Western movies. That's a Russian, Russian, a Russian sage, a Russian, I think it's called Russian sage, a Russian thistle. It's actually a non-native plant. You see it in Westerns, but it's it's a non-native plant that rapidly colonized the West once it got to North America. And the whole plant blows around. Um, there are some plants around here I see blowing around too, so I don't think it's limited to uh, to just sagebrush from the West, but uh so that's, that's another means of dispersal. Um, let's see, all sorts of, I find out wind dispersal fascinating because wind is a sort of universal agent on the earth's surface. There's generally winds blowing here and there now and then, and sometimes very strong winds. And plants have taken advantage of that, but they use many different plant parts to accomplish the same goal. Uh, I believe a maple seed uses an accessory part of the fruit to form the wings. What's called the the uh, um, of that you know the the double of the helicopter seeds uh, ashes. The wing is actually a part of the ovary, as are elm seeds. Uh, with a basswood, the uh, the um, the sort of long wing like attachment to the seed is actually a bract. Um, in the case of uh, of cottonwoods or milkweeds, it's called a coma. It's just a group of hairs that that are attached to the outside of the seed. In the case of like a dandelion or a or an aster, they're actually the modified sepals of the individual flower. I mean, the modified sepals of something like a a a, a stick seed turn into little prongs in there, and they're hitchhikers, and they grab onto you. The modified sepals of the dandelion turn into that little puff of hairs that then disperses the seed sadly into your lawn where it will germinate and start to grow um yeah it's just i think of plants is plants don't have a brain but they're amazingly amazingly smart in a way in a way that well i meant to look it up the uh british uh evolutionary uh, um scientist who wrote uh the blind watchmaker um and the and the selfish gene and he was talking about how how evolution creates these marvelously complicated structures that, that it would take a team of engineers a while to figure out how it works and why it works and to have designed that seems beyond the capability of a plant that doesn't have a brain and yet um that's that's this sort of evolution by natural selection creates over countless generations, all of these strange structures that take advantage of wind or water or animals that are just wandering by, animals that eat eat the fruit. I mean, all of that is is uh, the plants over countless generations take advantage of those factors in the environment to disperse their seeds again, because without dispersal, the plant's going to go extinct. I mean, in an evolutionary time, it's essentially, it's a dead issue. It's It's not going to survive if it can't if it can't move, even if it survives on our time scale, it might seem pretty permanent, but uh, eventually ice will cover the Chicago area again. I know that's hard to believe, but it will. And uh, and then any plant that can't move, get out of the way, will get will be killed. So uh, that mean that necessity of dispersal is ever present in the, in the life of plants. All right, that's it for the questions that I have, but if anybody wants to add their questions to the chat, now is the time. Again, your reminder for that is down at the bottom of the screen in the, the middle, um, either the dot, dot, dot at the right or a chat button, and you can type it in there. So we have a question on fire. Does fire affect germination or dispersal? Good question. Are there are plants that uh, like uh, one of our nemesis here, sweet clover, uh, that are the germination is stimulated by fire. Um, Sweet clover creates a tiny, tiny little 
Uh, it's a legume, so it creates a little legume pod, but it's very tiny. You probably wouldn't recognize it as a pod like a green pea or a pea pod you uh, you might uh, buy in the grocery store, but it's a tiny little pod. It only has a couple of seeds in it. Um, and uh, it probably has some means of getting around because this pod itself doesn't go very far. I would guess with many legumes, they're both nutritious in terms of protein content, but also have a hard seed coat. So probably they're eaten by birds and other animals. And then some of those seeds are, are excreted again somewhere else. So that's one means of dispersal. But another means of dispersal, what I meant to mention earlier is dispersal in time. We don't think of that as dispersal, but the ability to disperse in time is critical. We call that dormancy. So sweet clover can seeds can lie on the ground and stay there. We know for 20 or 30 years, and then a fire comes by and boom, they all germinate and start to grow. So it's essentially, it's the same mechanism of dispersal, finding the opportunity. You find the opportunity in space, so you find the opportunity in time. And its uh, ability to disperse in time allows it to survive in a place. I mean, we had sweet clover outbreaks here probably 15 years ago, something like that. Sweet clover was just a roadside weed, didn't have any problems, and suddenly whole fields were erupting in sweet clover. Still a bit of a mystery. Um, but the sweet clover seed was always there. Something stimulated it to suddenly to germinate, and there were just mil and literally millions of sweet clover plants covering acres of, of Glacial Park, and uh, doesn't, it seems to have receded in its... Uh, um productivity right now but uh yeah so uh so fire does stimulate the germination of seeds uh i don't know that it could be an agent of dispersal but it certainly stimulates germination in seeds and it creates seedbed where seeds can germinate that's famous throughout them um, a lot of my work in graduate school in the north woods was about the effect of fire creating a seedbed when you find pine trees growing in the north woods those pine seeds germinated on burned ground. You may be, you may be there 300 years later and it doesn't look like burned ground anymore, but the pine trees are generally all the same age and they germinated at one time after fire. Uh, often the case with hemlock and other conifers up there, but fire creates germination opportunities um, that uh, can be exploited by plants. Um, sweet clover would be the example of germination stimulated. Probably there are other prairie plants that are that way also, but I can't think of any names right off the top of my head. That kind of answered the other question I had in the chat was how long can seeds be dormant for after dispersal? So, well, we don't actually know. We know that they can go up to decades. I mean, I just talked with someone today. No, it was one of our ecologists and he said that at his last job there was worked in an arboretum and his last job there was one of the scientists there who was studying grasses and she and and she told him that she had found it possible to germinate uh canary grass seeds that were 20 years old and i thought oh no no canary grass is hard enough to deal with without having it come up 20 years later but uh that uh i mean it could be that you know, that germination, percent germination goes down over time, but the ability of one in a thousand seeds to germinate might go for centuries if they're buried under the right conditions. Wetland seeds are famous, wetland plant seeds are famous for disappearing. And then when you get rid of the canary grass, suddenly things like blue vervain pop up again that weren't there before. And, uh, the seeds had to just be lying there in the ground. It may have been there for decades, just waiting in that wet mud. But as long as the canary grass was there, they somehow sensed that it wasn't time to time to go. So, um, yeah, it's a... Awesome. Well, that's all the time we have for today. We appreciate everybody coming. And you're welcome to check out the recordings of all of our Tiny Tom Talks and any of the other longer time talks that we've had on our at discover MCCD YouTube channel under the Tom Talks playlist. So 
we are uh, done for the season and hopefully we'll have some new topics for you next year, but have a wonderful rest of your day. So long.